chapter 4, verse 8. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Genesis. Chapter 4. Are you comfortable? Thirty years I've been pastoring this year. Thirty years. Twenty years at Little Country Church. I've been asking folk, are they comfortable for 30 years? I was with some folk uh, well, last week with Pastor David Hilton. Things he would say, bless me, because there were things I've said. He looks at me as his pastor, and I thought to myself, Lord, if, when I leave this planet, it doesn't bother me that people forget my name. They can just remember the things I've said, particularly if they were principled and able to be blessed with. Those watching online, we thank you for tuning in today. We pray your Easter is blessed wherever you're at. We know we got people watching Arkansas and New Mexico and Alabama and other places, so that's a blessing. But good to have all of you here. The book of Genesis it starts off, Now Cain said to his brother Abel, Cain and Abel, the first two kids of Adam and Eve, Let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother, Abel, and he killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother, Abel? God asked two questions that I remember in the first of Genesis. One of them, he asked Adam, where are you at? And the second one, he asked Abel, where's your brother? They were both rhetorical questions. You know what rhetorical means? Yeah, he already knows the answer. My dad used to use rhetorical questions all the time. Who, who stole my hammer? He knew it was me or Jimmy. Mm. And the Lord said to Cain, where's your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you're under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. Blood seems to never die. Blood has this ability to always speak out. Blood speaks of life in the word of God, not death. But Father, I thank you for your word. I ask you to open the word to us today. And what, what, how much we know of the Bible, how little we know, help it just come to our minds as we walk through this. In Jesus' name, and everyone say it. Amen. Amen. Say this with me. I get a kick out of serving Jesus. And if the devil gets too close... He's going to get a kick out of it, too. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. In the beginning, when God made man, he placed him in a perfect environment. It was known as the garden. It was the will of God that when you saw man, you recognized there was a God. For God creates a perfect something, then he cre creates a reflection. When God created the perfect sun, he gave a reflection to it. It was called the moon. When heaven is our real home, where we're going to go someday, amen, and the throne of God. When you see heaven, you know then there's the earth, amen. The earth is a place for travelers like us. It's also known as the footstool of God. He also decided that when you saw him, God, amen, the creator, God's image, we're created in the what? Image of God. So when we see one another, it tells us there's a God. Now, to me, this is the most common sense, and you hear me use this phrase all the time. I have a biblical worldview. And when you think of it as the Bible, and this is the Word of God, the words of God, amen, this is all the only absolute truth, absolute truth I know. Today we live in a world that can't figure out what truth is. Amen. I mean, it's all messed up. I don't have to go into it with you, but you know it's all messed up right now. And it's like even our government doesn't know what truth is. Amen. Some churches have left the truth. And don't know what truth is. But I saw so I stand on this book. And when I stand on this book, I realize that Adam's death, God told Adam, he said, uh, he, he told him, touch the tree and you'll die. And so what happened? Adam and Eve, of course, deceived by the serpent, they touched the tree. Uh, what kind of tree? Was it an apple tree? Was it a peach tree? Was it, uh, I don't know what kind of tree. The Bible doesn't say. But in the, in the Hebrew language, it says, in dying, you shall die. In other words, your body is going to start dying. How many realize that you don't look like you used to look 60 years ago? You're starting heading down. You can't stop gravity. It's pulling. So in dying, we're dying. We're just heading out, man. I mean, it's, it's taking place. And you'll, one day you'll get, uh, get up to a certain age, you'll look back and say, where did the years go? 
Where did they go? 20 years as a pastor here. And I'm, saying, I'm telling you, they went by so quickly. So spiritual death took place in the life of Adam and Eve, and they could not live forever on this earth. And the Scripture said it was a curse. It was a curse of disobedience. It was a curse of sin. It was a separation from God. They didn't have that fellowship of walking with God in the garden again. After the separation, the Scripture says in Genesis verse 7, then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they, were, they realized they were naked. At that moment when they realized it, not up until till then so they sewed fig leaves together and they made coverings for themselves and ever since that time we have struggled with shame we have struggled with this thing amen and satan said to them if you eat you shall be as gods did you know that god already told them they were like him amen he already told them so he he lied to them amen that's that serpent that devil the only oh i don't like him Amen. So it was God's never, it was never God's intention for us to know what was good and evil. God wanted us to know what's best. And ever since then, we've been striving to get back to what is best. So that first question that was asked is, Adam, where are you? And again, you could hear the scream in the garden as they walked together. Adam, where are you? He was talking about it being mispositioned. And I see a lot of people that are out of position. You, know, you may be getting good, but you ain't got best yet. Amen. God's after you to get the best. Can I get an amen? So he said, Adam, where are you at? And thinking he could cover his error, thinking he could cover his shame, he took fig leaves and he sewed them together and he covered them around his loins. And God showed up and said, son, you, that, that, what, what are you doing with that? That's not going to help any. So the scripture says that God took an animal. It doesn't tell us what it was. Can, I'm going to just tell you, it had to be a lamb. And he took the skin from the lamb, and he covered Adam and Eve with the skin, de dealing with the issue of the blood. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. So when I look at this, I realize that God replaced those fig leaves. Let me tell you something else. Listen to me real good. God always covers what he's discovered. In other words, when I admit my sins to God, when I tell God about my missteps, Bad decisions. I was with a man at a wedding Friday night. I hadn't seen him in 20, 20 years. He walked up to me with tears in his eyes. The last time I saw him, he was crying because I had left him as his pastor. And because of that, there was that tense moment. And I looked at him and I said, I want you to know something. I'm sorry. I apologize. You know, this is not something that I foresaw. Amen. And then he looked at me and his wife said to me, Pastor, you have no idea how much this man has missed you. His name was Paul Kelly. I teared up. He teared up. We embraced, and I realized. And he looked at me, and he said, Pastor, I want you to know, whatever happened, I forgave you. I smiled back, and I said, good, because if you didn't, you're going to hell. <laughs> See, the bottom line is that God always covers whatever he discovers. We always try to uncover people. And gossip about people. But God has this way of covering our lives and looking after our lives. So he did it for Adam. He did it for Eve. Amen. He covered them up. Amen. At that moment. So God began this principle of called blood covering to redeem man so that throughout the ages, God began to turn the wrong back to right. See, he covered Adam and Eve with the blood or, or the skins of an animal. The blood goes into the ground. Amen. But then he just started this thing called blood covering. So he turned wrong back into right. So here we find Abraham and Isaac, Genesis chapter 22, verse 7. Isaac spoke up and said to his father, Abraham, Father, yes, my son, Abraham replied, the fire and the wood are here. You remember the story. God spoke to Abraham. He said, I want you to sacrifice your son. Amen, your only son. Matter of fact, one scripture calls him begotten son, only son. Amen, so he starts heading up the side of the mountain as they're going there. The son said to him, the fire and the wood are here, Isaac said, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Which tells me they had already started using lamb, amen, as sacrifice for offerings unto God. Abraham answered, God himself will provide a lamb. For the burnt offering, my son. And the two of them went up together. When they reached the place God had told him about, Abraham built an altar there and arranged the wood on it. He bound his son Isaac, laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Then he reached out his hand and he took the knife to slay his son. But the angel of the Lord called out to him from heaven, Abraham, Abraham. He said, here I am. And I've got to tell you, as a father and a grandfather, this scene brings emotion into me. Because I can't imagine a man giving up his only son in this way as he laid him on the altar he pulls back it, it's like you know the scripture tells us in the new testament 
Abraham said, even if I slew him, even if I would have sacrificed him, he believed that God would raise him from the dead. My goodness, that's how friend with God. That's somebody that knows the mind of God and the heart of God. So here, he reached out his hand, the word Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, don't lay a hand on the boy. Do not do anything from him. Now I know that you fear God because you've not withheld from me your only son. Let me say this. God will never ask any of us parents to ever sacrifice our children. Ever again. Amen. This was a once off. He would never do it again. So, Because I've met people that think, well, i got to sacrifice my ch children for the sake of this. No, sir. Your children are your greatest possession. They are your privilege. Let me say it like that. Not a possession, but a privilege that God has given you. And when he pulled back the knife, it was like, what am I going to do now? I, I'm here to sacrifice God. He said, don't lay a hand on him. In verse 13 says, Abraham looked up, and there in the thicket he saw a ram. Now, a ram is a male sheep caught by its horns. He went over and he took the ram, sacrificed it as a burnt offering instead of his son. So Abraham called that place the Lord will provide. And to this day, it said on the mountain of the Lord, it will be provided. This is where God got the name Jehovah Jireh. Now I know what you're thinking. Pastor, where are you going? Follow me. Follow me. Because I'm going to start here and I'm going to take this thing all the way to the cross. It's going to take a couple of days, but hang on. So he starts moving. So here... In this moment, he became Jehovah Jireh. Everybody say, the Lord will provide. Lord. Come on, say it again. See, I have this overwhelming thing about God providing. I have been down to a place of nothing several times in my life, and I've watched God provide. I've been hit by floods, and I've watched Jehovah Jireh show up. I've seen God start with us 20 years ago in a little rented facility in New Caney. 20 years later, we own 110 acres there, 5 acres here, and 2 churches at a youth camp. I said, the Lord will provide. Can I get a man? You're not as excited as I am. I said the Lord will provide. Amen. Hallelujah. It's like the old chicken hawk sitting up in a tree. I know, that was cute. Amen. It's the old chicken hawk sitting up in a tree, and he's there next to, 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 to a couple of buzzards, and the buzzards are up there, and the chicken hawk said, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. I can't stand it anymore. I'm hungry. And the old buzzard said, I say the Lord will provide. Chicken hawk said, no, I got to go. I got to eat something. I got to eat something. I'm hungry. And the, and the old buzzard said, I said the Lord will provide. And all of a sudden, the chicken hawk sees a chicken in the farmer's pen. He flies off the branch, flies down toward the, the chicken. By the time he gets there, it was too late. The farmer pulled a shotgun, and boom, he took that little chicken hawk out. All of a sudden, the two buzzards flew down to the ground, reached back into their feathers, pulled out a fork and knife, looked after the little chicken hawk, and said, I, I said, the Lord will provide. <laughs> Don't get too excited, can I get an Amen. So here he became a lamb for a man. When that, when that sacrifice took place, it was to provide a sacrifice for Isaac. So then it began. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 22 says, And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. And then we move into Genesis chapter 12 verse 3. When the scripture says, Tell the whole community of Israel that on this tenth day of each month, each man is to take a lamb for his family. One for each household, verse 7. Then they are to take some of the blood and they put it on the sides and the tops of the door frames of the houses where they eat the lambs. That same night they are to eat the meat roasted over the fire along with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. This is known as the Passover. When we find Jesus before the crucifixion, it's the time of Passover. So here we find that they took the blood. Many of you understand this. When we take communion here, we speak of this. They took the blood and they put it on the doorpost. The death angel, the tenth plague in Egypt was going to pass over. When the death angel passed over, the firstborn of all that land were to die if they didn't have the blood. It covered them. It covered the family. It took care of the family there. So all of a sudden now it became a lamb for a family. He said, when you take this lamb, when you partake and you eat of the lamb, make sure you eat some bitterness with it, some herbs with it. Can I tell you, as you serve the Lamb, as you serve God, there's always a little bitter. And the issue in life is the bitterness, if you just need a little. If I say a little. See, bitter, some people, put life is too bitter. Your life is so bitter because you ain't got enough Lamb in your life. You ain't got enough Jesus in your life. You need a little more Jesus. The more Jesus you get, you can handle a little bit of bitter. When I'm eating Chinese food, now, I use this yellow stuff they put on it. It's a mustard. It's made out of petroleum stuff. It's got to be. It's got gasoline in it. But if I just put a little bit on that, on my General Cho's chicken, oh, it's good. I can breathe, man. It's great. But if you put too much, like I did the first time, you may never do it again it's a little bit of bitter and a whole lot of lamb can I get an amen 
Amen. And then after the Passover, there was a day known as atonement. Amen. The high priest would go into the Holy of Holies. Amen. And he would lay hands on the head of a live goat and confess over it all the wickedness and rebellion of the Israelites. They did this in the tabernacle for 40 years. And they put the, the sin. It was known as a scapegoat. And again, not trying to make the goat a lamb. I'm just telling you it was the blood of the goat. It was the blood of the animal that gave the, the permission for all the sin. But all it did was roll the sins forward. Just rolled them forward. It was like you telling uh, somebody you're in debt with, uh, uh, you, that I'll pay my debt later. And you just keep rolling it forward. You just pay, keep paying the little bit of interest on your credit card. But the principal keeps rolling forward. And it rolled forward for 3,000 years. It just kept rolling forward. And it kept moving forward. But at that moment, not only had it became a lamb for a man, a lamb for a family, but now it's become a, a lamb for a nation. And then when Jesus walked, he started walking up on the shores. Amen. John the Baptist saw him. And when John saw him, that's his cousin, man. He's just a few months older than Jesus. And when he saw him, amen, in John 1, 29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him. And what did he say? He didn't say, hey, cuz. He didn't say, hey, hey, hey there, uh, 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 what is it, Martha, Mar Mar Martha's, Mar Martha's boy, amen. He looked at him and he said, behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. Come on, say it. World. Not just America, but the, world. amen, not just this side, but the. The world, the whole world, amen, at that moment, he became the, the propitiation, the mediator between God and man. So it's not just a lamb for a man or a lamb for a family or a lamb for a nation. Now he's a lamb for the world. So God began to turn wrong back to right. Watch what he did. This is what I mean by overcoming. You're talking about an overcomer. Adam had lost it in the garden. Jesus got it back in the garden of Gethsemane. When he sat there and he prayed, not my will, but thine be done. Three times he prayed it, not my will, but thine be done. Did you know blood poured from his body at that moment? It began to pop out through his pores, and now we're starting to see the blood issue coming to, come to uh, fruition here. Adam lost blessing, and he covered his shame with a fig tree, with a fig leaf. Well, Jesus, I've always thought about this. Jesus walked along and saw a fig tree, and he cursed it. He cursed the fig tree. The Bible says that the tree wasn't even in season to bring forth anything. And yet Jesus looked at that tree and he said, I remember you. I remember what you did. I remember how you tried to cover Adam and Eve. I remember that. He, they, there's no way you can cover that way. You have to cover with the blood. So he cursed the fig tree. On the day of Passover, atonement, the priest had a lamb in the temple. God's lamb was in the courtroom. We'll break this down in a minute. High priest would check the lamb for blemishes, Luke chapter 23. Did you know it was a four-day checking? They checked this lamb. It's known as the Paschal lamb. They would check that lamb for four days. Jesus, after Gethsemane, he goes into the court. It's four days until he's on the cross. Amen. So as he's moving toward this moment, they're checking him. And the scripture says that he was one that had no blemish in him. We find the people even said, the, the leaders said, we find no fault in him. So the lamb was caught in the thorns for Abraham. Jesus wore a crown of thorns. Lost at a tree, found at the cross. The sins of the world laid upon him. Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? See, normally I love to build up to this moment, but I'm trying to throw all this into one, one sermon, one message. But on that cross, when he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The scripture said that it went dark. It went dark. As if it was night. I read it out of, the, out of the Greek language, and it says this. It didn't go dark in Jerusalem. It didn't go dark in Israel. It went dark all around the world. That means no matter where you stood on this planet, when Jesus said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Darkness came over the world. He always was his God. He never backed off, but the sins, my sins, your sins, those things that were nasty and dark and mean, belligerent, they were all laid upon him at that moment. And he took them. He took them just like the, the priest would take the sins of the people that were confessed and he would rub it in blood upon the, the, the goat's head and, the, and on the ram. Amen. At that moment, all of it was put upon him. Adam was naked and ashamed. 
Jesus was stripped of his clothes. You don't see this. You, many of us can't even comprehend this. But my understanding, Jesus was naked on the cross. The only thing that covered him was the congealed blood that had flowed from his body after the beatings of 39 stripes. Amen. And the plucking of his beard. Amen. And the spittle. That's the only thing that covered him. And yet he stood on the cross with no shame and spoke out seven sayings from the cross. From Adam's side came Eve. God created Eve right out of the side of Adam. When God wanted to create the church, his church, the church that he loves, amen, they pierced him in the side, and blood flowed and gave birth to his church. Therefore, we proclaim, as Paul did in Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. I say that with, with tremendous joy in my heart i didn't have to take the cross i didn't have to go and do what he did amen the lamb was for me it was for my family it's for our nation it's for our world i'm crucified with christ nevertheless i live yet not i it's not me but christ lives in me it's a great mystery isn't it that jesus would live inside of you come on. he's inside of you. oh come on pastor there ain't no way you don't know the mess i'm in he decided the day that you accepted him that he would come and live inside of you and now you are crucified with christ which means are crucified you know what, what crucified people don't do they don't slap you back hello they don't kick you back oh it's so hard in the church we just at least want to raise a finger come on give me an amen Amen. We, 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 we. And so you, every now and then you got to remind yourself, I'm crucified with Christ. Amen. And, and the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Our high priest, Jesus was the Lamb of God. And it, it messed the disciples up. They were looking for a lion, but he's coming back as a lion. But his first time he came as a lamb. At daybreak, the scripture says, during his trial, the council of the elders of the people, both the chief priests and teachers of the law, they met together, and Jesus was led before them. They said, if you are the Christ, tell us. Jesus answered, I'll tell you, but you won't believe me. And if I ask you, you would not answer. But from now on, the Son of Man will be seated at the right hand of the mighty God. They all asked, are you then the Son of God? He replied, you are right in saying I am. Then they said, why do we need any more testimony? We've heard it from his own lips. This is what got him in trouble. Because they said he was. But he said, you're going to see me at the right hand. Now, well, you're standing there before 70 scribes of the Sanhedrin. you got the council. you got a judge in the middle, a scribe on the left hand, and the one on the left hand. And you got another scribe, a judge on the right hand. Disputes brought to them. The judge made a ruling. All sentences and guilty verdicts are read by the scribe on the left. So if you're guilty, the guy on the left is going to pronounce you guilty. Now watch this. The guy on the right hand, a scribe on the right hand, he gave out pardons. So when Jesus said, you're going to see me on the right hand of God. So what's he doing? He's not here judging us, being mean toward us. He's giving out pardons. Amen. From now on, you're going to hear. So you got to understand, God does not love you because Jesus died for you. But Jesus died for us because God loves us. That's why he loves, he, he, he got to catch us in you. Therefore, God was never angry at us. He was angry at the curse. He was upset at the curse. He was upset at the fact that we had fallen, that we had gone so low. Amen, that's what God was upset. So Jesus is the evidence that Jesus, that God loves us. So God began to turn wrong back to right. Matthew 27, verse 50. And when Jesus had cried out again, what did he say? To tell us that it is finished. In a loud voice, he gave up his spirit. At that moment, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. The earth shook and the rock split. Once, once a time, one time a year during Passover was the Day of Atonement. The high priest would enter and offer the blood sacrifice, an unblemished lamb, to cover the sins of the people. However, at the very moment when Jesus died on the cross in Matthew 27, amen, it tells us, now watch this, there was a curtain here and then there was a curtain here. You could walk in, other priests could come here, but only the high priest could go behind the Holy of Holies. The curtain was this thick, thick as a man's hand, finger to finger. It was hung by 600 priests, and the, he would go inside there, and he would offer sacrifice, amen, at one time. Matter of fact, his sacrifice was offered at 6 p.m., 6 p.m. Why is this important? 
Because Jesus said, it is finished at 6 p.m. He went on the cross at 9. By 12 o'clock, darkness had covered the land. He said six things, and finally, he pushed himself up on that nail, and he said, it is finished. Not I'm finished, but it's finished. What's finished? Amen. I tell you what's finished. Blood sacrifice once and for all. Never have to do it again. Never have to slay another sheep. Never have to slay another goat. Never have to lay out any blood. Amen. His blood was enough. Amen. To take care of us all the way up until he comes back again. So while Caiaphas was in that, one of those who judged him is back there behind the curtain and he's putting blood and he's, he's giving out the blood. He's putting it on the altar. Amen. At that moment, Jesus said, it's finished. When he's finished, Whoosh! Amen. It's cut. The, the, the curtain is torn from top to bottom. Amen. And I'm thinking to myself, I wonder what Caiaphas thought at that moment. Rocks. It was an earthquake. Rocks were breaking to rent to tear. When's the last time you saw somebody tear a rock in two? At the sound of three words, it is finished, the rocks tore. Amen. The graves popped open. People who were dead were getting up and walking again. Yeah. Crazy. I don't have an answer. Don't ask me after church, Pastor, what's that mean? I ain't got no idea. Yeah. All I know is the blood hit the ground, and there's power in the blood, and the dead got up and started walking around. So here, at this moment, he's laying the blood out. The curtain is torn. <laughs> In their blindness, they sewed the curtain back. The scripture is so precise, it says it tore from top to bottom. Top to bottom. Ripped. It wasn't to let other people in. It was to let God out. He said, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people. He goes, oh, amen. So on this, on Good Thursday, I said on Good Thursday is when they crucified Jesus. I know you want to say Friday, but you can't get three nights from Friday to Sunday. So why don't we just tell the truth and shame the devil? On Good Thursday, that high priest entered in to offer the sacrifice of an unblemished lamb. And there on Golgotha's hill was God's unblemished lamb, the Son of God. He had been inspected. He had been beaten. He, he had no sin, no wrong. Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. Looked at a thief, said, Today you'll be with me in paradise. Amen. Today I'm going to get you to be with my father. And he began to lay the statements out. He looked down at the cross and he saw his mother Mary there. And he said to John, take care of mama. Woman, behold your son. Son, behold your mama. Take care of mama while I'm gone. Amen. Take care. And he began to lay out things. Your last statements before you pass are so powerful. And he began to say and give pardon out. Then he said, Father, forgive them. And then, my God, my God. Why did you leave me? And for a moment, the sins of the world were put upon that blemished lamb, poured upon him. Hebrews 8 through 10 beautifully explained how in Jesus, amen, he became our high priest. He entered heaven, amen, the holy of holies, once and for all, not by the blood of sacrificial animals, but by his own precious blood on the cross. Christ himself was the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And we accept that. We accept that sacrifice Amen. I can't save me. I can't. I've tried to save me. I can't save me. I need help. I need a crutch. I need forgiveness. I need shame covered. Wrongs made right. I need him to turn wrong back to right again. I see him do it all the time. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all men, the testimony given in its proper time. We receive the spirit of adoption. As you know, I'm an adopted father. I have three adopted kids. And the word is Abba, Father. No one, everybody that's been born again is adopted. 
The power of adoption is this. You can't unadopt a child. My, those three remind me of that. You can't unadopt us. You're stuck with us. You chose us. God chose you. You're not going to get unadopted. He's a mediator between God and men. I mean, not a separator. When you accept Jesus, He mediates between you and the Father. The book of Hebrews says that we can come boldly to the throne of grace where we can find help in the time of need. Amen. That He's there petitioning for us. He's on the right hand giving out pardons. Pardons. We watch the news now. We look for people to be pardoned. Some get evicted, some get pardoned. I'm a man who's been to jail. I was e convicted. Convicted. Amen. You search my record, you'll see it. But my, my kids have already searched it. Those adopted ones I can't get rid of. There's something powerful that he's not a separator. But I will say this. If you don't accept him, there is a separation. Heads bowed and eyes closed on this Resurrection Sunday. He was a lamb for a man. Then he became a lamb for a family. Then he became a lamb for a nation. And then behold the Lamb of God. He takes away the sins, the failures of the world. He turns wrong back to right. He reverses curses. That's what he does. You were cursed the day you were born. The scripture says we were born in sin. It was our nature to lie, to steal, to deceive. Born in it. God said, listen, I've come to reverse that curse, to take it away. I want you to know that you can live a life that's pleasing to God. And when you've got a need, you can go to Him and He'll hear you. If you've been away from God, would you put your hand up now and pull it back down? Just put it up and pull it back down. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Three, four, five hands. Anyone else? Just put your hand up and back down again. Yes, sir, thank you. Anyone else? Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. See, it's a resurrection day. It's a glorious day. Amen. Would you hold those hands back up and we'll pray together? Everybody, Lord Jesus, forgive me my sins. You are my mediator. You took my sins on the cross. Your blood covers me. I thank you, O oh, Lamb of God. I love you. Be my Lord and my Savior. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Now, now, now listen, listen to me. You prayed, but now you got to start making some decisions. Now, I'm going to serve God. I'm going to live for God. Amen. His blood took care of me and covers me. He did his part. <clears throat> now I need to do my part. Bo, you come on back here to the back. Would you get ready to be baptized? Amen. But he did his part. He took care of everything. Every wall was broken down. I hope your mind is descriptive as mine. I preached this sermon all night last night. I struggled to fall. I'd fall asleep and preach, wake up, think about it, fall asleep, preach, get up, sleep, preach, get up. Just, just couldn't shake it. And I think about him, and I see what's going on in the Middle East. I see blindness. I'm not mean about it. I see divisions in Isaac and Ishmael. I see the Jews and the, the, the Muslims. And yet, God, I stand here as a believer in Christ saying, you're the great mediator. I'm looking for a last day's revelation and revival that people would start to understand he's the Lamb of God that takes away the sins of the whole world. In Guatemala, he takes away the sins. Amen. In Korea, he takes away the sins. Amen. In Argentina, he takes away the sins. He just, he's a, 
he takes them away. And if, I, if my shame's taken away, my past is taken away, I can live for God. I can press forward. Amen? Come on, give me an amen. David, you go back there if you will. I need our uh, servant leaders to come. Give me a hand on this Easter morning. If you need a tithe or offer an envelope, it's in front of you. Amen. I said that I would give. Uh, well, let's do this first offering first. You got your tithe and offer? Pastor David Hilton said something uh, Tuesday night that I've never heard. Wednesday night. I thought I knew it all. He said out of Malachi when God says, shall a man rob God? First off, you can't rob God. You're crazy if you think you can. But what you rob God from is being able to bless you. You, you make God mad. You upset God because you refused to be a blessing when you're given. You refuse to let it go. I'm sitting back and I'm thinking, in 40-something years of serving God, I've been a giver. And I've watched when I didn't have anything, my giving kept going. I would never let it go. Because in my giving, I found that God had gave to me and that God was a giver. So I don't want to rob God of a blessing to bless me. And I want to tell you, He has blessed me. Amen. I want Him to bless you. So if you have opportunity to give right now, everybody already got your offering. Now, I don't have my phone here, but one of the things I have promised is that I was going to learn how to give on my phone. Because many of y'all are doing that. I don't know how. My son bought me lunch the other day with his phone that we're paying for. It's amazing what you can do. So if you're giving on your phone, as the servant leaders pass by, you just hold your phone up. Amen. As we give today, we're believing God for more money, sales and commission, gifts and surprises, finding money, bills paid off, settlements, inheritance, rebates and returns, debts demolished, royalties received, favor and success to the kingdom. Amen. All right, guys, get that back there. Justin, after you get that back there, come back with a bucket. Stand at the back door because we're going to give an offering toward those that are going to Guatemala to get them there in whatever's left in Mississippi. That was my promise. Are you back there, Pastor David? Is Bo back there?